Good evening and welcome back to Midnight Rental. The clock just struck midnight, so you know what that means. We're closed. And now that it's after hours here at Midnight Rental, we can have a little fun. It's a new year, right? So what does that mean? Spring cleaning. We might as well start with getting rid of a bunch of junk around the store, like this pile of mail. Bill, 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 Bill. Oh, a letter from one of our viewers. Ah. Dear Lenora, I love your little program and your store. Might I suggest that you consider lowering your rental fees and your necklines? Also, P.S. Can you please set aside a copy of Bloodsport for me? Love, Gerald. Gerald, we're closed. Just keep going. Bill, Bill, <gasps> oh no, a form from the IRS. You know what that means, tax season. Oh no, don't know how to do the store's taxes. It shouldn't be too bad. You kept all the expense receipts from last year, right? Yeah, I kept the receipts. Um, anyways, we wouldn't have to worry about any of this if we had a sponsor. Then I could hire an accountant and an editor, and then every year I wouldn't be stressed out on how to do all of this stuff. Like an AA sponsor? No, like a sponsor from a company that's well-established and they make enough money that they bring it in and give it to us and then we advertise for them. Or maybe an independently wealthy older man who just finds the lot of us so adorable that they want to throw their money at us and see us excel. Well, where are you going to find one of those? I don't know. I guess I'm going to have to take out an ad or maybe make a viral TikTok to get someone's attention. Oh, Midnight Rental. Hello? Hello? Oh, hello? Yeah, hi, we're closed. When's the next episode? We're literally filming it right now. When's it gonna be done? Oh my God, we're closed. It's not that hard, just finish editing it. Oh my God. Anyway, maybe I can write off some expenses around here, like that new Dropbox we just had installed. <laughs> Speaking of write-offs, here comes mine. Hey! Carl, are you still writing off Carmine as a dependent? <laughs> Why else does anybody have kids? Lenora! Take a look at these dating apps. Maybe if you can't find the company sponsor, your independently wealthy man is hiding in here. Mm, <laughs> I don't know. I don't really have the greatest track record when it comes to dating. And plus, have you seen the people on those things? They all smell like ham. Mm, let me make your profile. Carmine, I would rather drag myself bare-assed through a field of cacti than get on a dating app. Though, at the rate things are going around here, it might come down to it. And it's also topical because tonight's episode is dealing with love gone wrong. These Valentine's Day movies that we're going to take a look at all deal with jilted lovers. Now, I know you've heard of the phrase, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, but surely you might remember the paper thin fragility of the male ego when faced with rejection. Hey, Lenora. What's the next episode? <sighs> Gee, Emmy, aren't you the psychic? You tell me. Mm, I can only predict what I already know. Like I'm getting a vision that tonight's episode is all about love gone wrong. There it is. Oh. We're filming it right now and we're closed. Hello, Lenora. I heard you were looking for a sponsor. The first movie we're going to take a look at tonight is Valentine, released in 2001 by Artisan Entertainment. Directed by Jamie Blanks, who also directed Urban Legend, this movie is about as Y2K as it gets. Just look at this cast. Okay? Marley Shelton, Denise Richards, Katherine Heigl, right. Jessica Caulfield, Jessica Capshaw, and 
number one vampire guy in the group, David Boreanaz. The plot centers around a group of friends who share a commonality stemming from a junior high dance. Jeremy Melton, who is prone to nosebleeds and also looks like little Dwight Schrute, asks each of them if they'd like to dance. They all turn him down, with the exception of Dorothy. However, when they both get caught kissing beneath the bleachers, Dorothy lies and says that he attacked her out of embarrassment. Like it, Buffalo? Getting hot? Stop it! Get away from me! Is pervert at it again? Perv attack you? Yeah, Jeremy attacked me. He attacked me. Not cool, Dorothy. You make out loud and proud. A group of boys strip Jeremy down, beat him up in front of the whole school, and then he's taken away to reform school. Fast forward 13 years, the same group of girls are still friends, but now find themselves with the arduous task of being in their mid-twenties without a boyfriend. Oh, the horror. Now, as if blind dates and video dating weren't bad enough, they then find themselves being stalked and sent creepy, violent valentines by a Cupid masked killer. Now, the most unrealistic thing about this movie is a scene where Denise Richards' character pours herself a bowl of Cap'n Crunch and immediately starts eating it without waiting the required two minutes for the milk to soften it up. Her mouth would be pouring blood. One by one, they begin to get picked off, and with the help of a sheriff, they realize that Jeremy Melton could be the one behind all of it. There are a few subplots going on, with Marley Shelton's character Kate, who is reconnecting with her ex, Adam Carr, who you know as David Boreanaz from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, who's an alcoholic struggling to stay sober. Honestly, I don't know which are wider, his shoulders or his brow bone. And believe me, that's nothing I'm saying is a negative. I would absolutely make out with him underneath the bleachers, out in the open, any day. Then there's Dorothy, all grown up, who welcomes a mystery guy, Campbell, to stay with her in her mansion after literally knowing him for five minutes. Girl, get a grip. At a party, a woman who looks like adult version Topanga approaches them and informs her that Campbell is actually a con artist who bled her dry in a previous relationship and to be careful. But Dorothy is blinded by love and potential and believes he truly loves her. She casts aside the woman's claims and kicks her out. The rest of the film is a race to see who will make it and who can outrun the cherubic mask killer. While the mere mention of Denise Richards at this point still had everyone like this ever since her role in Wild Things, it really is Marley Shelton who's the star of this movie. Though truly, I've always genuinely loved Denise Richards as an actor. She carries her own and commands every scene that she's in. And how did they find this absolute exact miniature copy of her as a tween to play her younger character self? It's freaking remarkable. But as the lead, Marley Shelton has always possessed this unique likability. I enjoy watching whatever she's in on screen, and that of course includes Scream 4, Scream 5, Planet Terror, you name it. You can't help but root for her. When I said that this was about as Y2K of a movie as it gets, tramp stamp of a butterfly, I didn't necessarily mean that as a bad thing either. It's a product of its time, and it feels very similar to how Urban Legend was shot, and that's again thanks to director Jamie Blanks also having been in the director's seat on both films. Now, I personally don't find the Cherub Mask particularly scary, but there are still some good kills, and it definitely has nuances of Scream ingrained in its plot and performance. We've got a mask, a black gown, the telltale cordless phone, Denise Richards' character is named Paige Prescott, echoing Sidney Prescott, and then there's this guy who looks like off-brand Billy Loomis. I saw this movie opening weekend when it came out, and even though I immediately guessed the killer, because I don't think that they put enough other options in the script for the viewer to cast suspicions on, and maybe there was a bit too much time spent on the subplots for those other suspicions to cook and develop, I honestly still thought it was a super fun movie. It's quick, well shot, well edited, and has some genuinely funny moments. Having been released in 2001, it has that extremely specific feeling for the time period between like 1998 and 2004 that always makes me look forward to watching it every Valentine's Day. Plus, I mean the soundtrack. Come on. A deadly avalanche leaves a family trapped with a killer and no way out. Dana Hasselhoff, Michael Gross. Hi, it's me. Avalanche, world premiere Tuesday at 8, 7 central. Parental discretion advised. Tonight, pour yourself a drink. Oh. Slip into something comfortable. You know, my underwear is crotchless. I want to crotch right out of them. And share a little quality time with friends. Not the first crab I've seen in here, but certainly the biggest. Catch a brand new episode of The George Carlin Show, part of Fox's Halloween Bash, tonight after Married with Children. 
Cleveland moves up on the list of most livable cities at 11. How did you know? I saw your profile on Binder. Binder? I have a profile on Binder? I, I don't even know what that is. I didn't make a profile on Bi... Carmine? I made it while you were talking. You put my phone number in my profile? Why do you think you were getting all those phone calls? So, are you an independently wealthy man looking for love? <laughs> no, no, Lenora. Binder is an advertising investment app that is photo-based. Uh-huh. I run a parent group that owns several successful businesses, similar to how Darden Restaurant Group owns Red Lobster, The Olive Garden, and Bahama Breeze. And we'd love to sponsor Midnight Rental. Oh my god! The Olive Garden? Yes, I say yes. Sign me up. Yes to everything. <laughs> now, now, I said similar to the Olive Garden. We own a different set of businesses. There's a lot we'll have to talk about, but we're excited to have you on board. Be sure to open that package I sent you. It contains some very important outfits. This includes wardrobe? Miss Kelsey Grammer, Paul Reiser, Bill Maher, Jonathan Winters, and Comedy's Best in the American Comedy Awards, Monday on ABC. He predicted the San Francisco earthquake. Now he predicts the next one. Find out where on Unsolved Mysteries. Then, Dear John meets L.A. Law's Corbin Burnson. I will personally set you up with a woman guaranteed to melt your belt buckle. And Robert Stack guest stars on The Finelli Boy. You are such a reason. It's a special guest star Wednesday only on NBC. Now, let's take a look at the movie that set the stage for putting fear into the hearts of lovers on St. Valentine's Day. I am, of course, talking about My Bloody Valentine, released in 1981 and directed by George Mahalka. The plot is appropriately centered around Valentine's Day and set in the town of Valentine Bluffs, which is a big mining town. Now, this town has no shortage of hometown pride. We start the film with Valentine Bluffs getting ready to paint the town red as it's bringing back its beloved Valentine's Day dance for the first time in 20 years because it takes exactly that long for a generation to forget why they stopped doing them in the first place. You're right, Mabel, but I think we'd all be better off if you played down the fact that it's the first Valentine's dance in 20 years, if you know what I mean. Thankfully, though, every movie from this era has their own specific crazy Ralph to remind them of why they're all going to die. I know what I'm talking about. I'm telling you now. This town is accursed. It's got a death curse. You see, Valentine Bluffs had previously held a huge annual Valentine's Day dance each year to celebrate the holiday and the town's namesake until one fateful Valentine's Day, when two mining supervisors were so impatient to get to the dance that they left a group of five miners down below in the shaft with unchecked methane levels. This caused a massive explosion, trapping all of the miners while the Valentine's Day dance went on without incident. They spent six weeks digging and finally recovered the miners. However, it was only one miner, Harry Warden, who would survive thanks to cannibalism. Now, he of course went crazy and was sent to the state hospital for a year, but then got out, put his mining suit back on, killed the two supervisors who had left him and his crew down there. Oh, and then he also cut out their hearts, threw them in a couple Valentine's Day chocolate boxes, and left them as prizes at the dance with a note warning the townspeople to never hold another dance again. Well, they listened for 20 years until present day when we see a bunch of bumbling folks just giddy to bring their beloved dance back. Now, I can kind of see where Harry's coming from because he at least has an extremely valid point to be angry. And truly, the quote holds true. Those who fail to remember history are doomed to repeat it. 
There are no shortage of heart decorations or warm bodies to pick off in this movie. It is full tilt 80s Valentine's Day gore, and it's exactly why it stands the test of time as a beloved holiday themed slasher. You've got the perfect mix of young people who just want to drink and ignore reality, the older generation townspeople who want to move on from the past, and multiple warnings from the returning minor that get more and more bloody. There are a few incredible scenes that make this film a standout, and one involves Madame Mabel's laundromat. The mint green color of the machines, coupled with the contrasting red decorations, makes the whole scene even more jarring. The mayor has canceled the dance, and that's all there is to it. Well, in the light of Mabel's death, he had no choice. And there'd be no parties either. We owe her that much respect. Mabel would have wanted us to have the dance. I mean, she worked so hard on it. Yeah, you can't cancel it now. She's just looking for an excuse to cancel a dance. Uh, I think she'd be okay with the dance being canceled, especially since she's dead because of it. But since we can't ask her, maybe let's just pull the plug on it and start listening to the I told you so guy. But, of course, young people can't miss out on an opportunity to get drunk and mash their bodies together. So, they decide to have a party anyways in the mine. Yeah. Why don't we have a Valentine party? Yeah. Yeah. Where? You just got this whole town locked up, great guys. In the mine. Yeah. That'd be great. It would. What a blast. In the mine, that's exactly what it would be. Oh, oh it'd be great. Where, everyone? It's more than Ooh. Ooh. Aware of what you make fun of, you little asshole. I cannot think of a more miserable location to have a party than in an underground mine in February. Just go to someone's wood paneled basement. Especially since it was the scene of the accident. The I told you so guy tries to warn them, but they, of course, ignore him, so you know what's in store. Forget about having a party at all tomorrow night. Or you'll be sorry. Don't say I didn't warn. Honestly, the biggest disappointment for me is that the I told you so guy gets killed. He was on Harry Warden's side and was a staunch advocate for him. You can't go against your fans like that. They start their party above ground before a small group of them break off and, of course, venture down below into the mine shaft. What you expect to happen next does, as they are, of course, followed, trapped, and picked off one by one. It quickly becomes a case of who can you trust, and by the end, we discover it was not Harry Warden after all. It was an ambitious movie to take the scares downstairs into a mine with pickaxes as weapons, as during this era most slashers stuck to summer camps or houses with babysitters and knives as the preferred weapons. It was also revolutionary for being the only movie I can think of that has a death by way of hot dog water. Like I said, the movie's directed by George Mahalka, who also directed Pinball Summer, and he filmed both of those movies in Canada nearly back to back. He also used a lot of the same actors in both films. Unfortunately, the film went through the ringer when it came to editing to meet ratings approval, getting nearly just as many cuts as there were pickaxe stabs in the head. Entire scenes and kills were eliminated from the final film, with some being lost forever. The makeup effects were created in part by Thomas Berman, who has worked for decades as a makeup effects artist on such notable films as Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Goonies, Halloween 3, Cat People, Con Air, and Scrooged. The uncut version shows what remained of the salvaged and restored footage of several of Berman and his team's startling effects, including Sylvia's infamous shower death. A few minutes of trimmed work print footage survived in a storage closet, and the Shout Factory release is the most complete version that you can find today. For me, what makes the film appealing is the large cast of youths. It has that similar feeling of camaraderie like the first Friday the 13th, and it has really strong character development, which is why it's a staple in horror movie history and will forever have my heart. It can't really happen. It can't. Hey. How you doing? How are you? Bad. Fine. I'm kind of hungry. Are you? Yes. That's good, because look over there. What? You see what I see? Whoa! Double cheeseburgers. Exactly. Watch this. You're going to like this. Here we go. Coming through. Playing through, fellas. Watch your back. Watch. Got it. I... Oh, thank, 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 thank. Not bad. Burger King BK Doubles, featuring the barbecue bacon double cheeseburger and the new salsa double with jalapeno cheese. BK Doubles, only at Burger King. Aha! Hey, you got it. Congratulations. Give, give, give me that. Give, give. Critics say House of Buggin' is already funnier than Saturday Night Live. How do I do it? I don't know. I just did. Tonight, 
Kirk, they're taking you to the newest Star Trek movie. Kirk is fat, man. He's pig fat. Look at him. House of Buggin'. Look, even, even his uniform has stretch marks. A brand new episode next. Isn't it absolutely amazing that there are so many interesting things you'll find in kids' land? I never know what I'm going to be doing or where I'm going to be going or who I'm going to see next. So tune into Kids Land weekday mornings and afternoons on Channel 43. In Kids Land, anything can happen. So look for us. The next person you see could be you. Tie game, back after this. Twist off seven up caps and win as the Uncola celebrates the 100th year of basketball. Collect all the seven up caps you can because if you spell Y E A R, you'll win a $10,000 college scholarship or win a Spalding mini basketball instantly. So collect your Uncola caps and win. Seven up employees not eligible. <laughs> win part of a million dollars in scholarships from seven up the uncola coming soon to box oh my god that's my roger and audi <laughs> the comedy that asked the question can marriage survive eight years in the state penitentiary the test of time when will it ever end rosie o'donnell i'm going to disneyland and melissa gilbert brinkman our first chance to see our husbands you would choose a hot tub over seeing audi I choose a pap smear over seeing Artie. Stand by your man. Premieres next Sunday after Herman's Head. Oh. oh, man. I do not know about this new wardrobe that Bernard sent over. Is there a problem, Lenora? Wait. Where are you coming from? The phone didn't even ring. We had an entire security system installed in your store. Your setup was incredibly outdated. We have a continuous two-way camera and speaker system now. Wait, so you can see and hear us? 24-7. It's for quality assurance purposes. Right. Well, back to the wardrobe, Bernard. Don't you think that this is a little high cut? We're a family-friendly company, Lenora. We had to class you up a bit if you'll be representing us. We can't scare away our customers. That's how we'll bring in our profit. Well, Bernard, historically, the type of viewers that I attract are all thanks to the dress. You see, I'm a horror host. Horror with an H, three R's, two O's. Lenora? Fine, I'm a team player. Okay, even though I'm wearing this, I'm ready to intro the show. Three, two. Good evening and welcome to Midnight Rental. Tonight- oh, No, no, Lenora. You have to use our intro, which I'm required to voice. Good evening and welcome to Midnight Rental, brought to you by Con Agra Food Group, a subsidiary of Meta Beta AI and Dress Barn Venture Group. Party on, Lenora, and party on, Carl. Hey, that is not how we intro the show. And why are you required to voice it? It's all in the contract, Lenora. Plus, come on, have you heard these pipes? I mean, I guess. Now, before you can continue on with the program, don't forget that you have to log in your required hours. Log in my required hours? What, at the store? I'm here all the time. <laughs> no, no, not at your store. You have to go to our stores to complete your duties. What? Look in the package, Lenora. Everything you need is in there. Will do. Midnight Rental will be right back after these commercial messages. Midnight Rental, brought to you by ConAgra Food Group, a subsidiary of Meta Beta AI and Dress Barn Venture Group, will be right back after these messages. Party on, Lenora! Oh my god, is he going to do that every single time? So, you really like that, huh? Oh, yeah. It's great. Things you never heard about a brand cereal before. It's brand. It's what? 
bread. No, it isn't. Isn't bread mushy? These flakes are crunchy. Kellogg's Frosted Bran is different. It's lightly frosted and very crunchy, even in milk. Hey, Mom, the cereal you got? That's really good. Kellogg's Frosted Bran. It sure doesn't sound like bran. So you like them. I love them. Take a close look at these two spaghetti sauces, Prego on the left and Ragu Old World Style on the right, and decide for yourself which one comes out on top. We think the message is getting through. Prego, homemade taste. It's in there. Two of your favorites, M&M's and peanut butter, are together at last. M&M's peanut butter chocolate candies. The best thing to happen to peanut butter since jelly. Fatal Flaws on the next First Report, 5 o'clock on Channel 3. Now, the staying power of the original My Bloody Valentine and its lack of sequels or franchise milking made it prime for a reboot in an era when it was becoming hip to reuse and recycle popular movies. And in 2009, we got just that with My Bloody Valentine in 3D. Directed by Patrick Lucier, the screenplay was written by Todd Farmer and Zane Smith, and it loosely follows the original film's plot, but with some updated twists and turns. First and foremost, this movie was filmed with 3D technology, real 3D technology to be specific, and was released to more than 1,000 theaters equipped with the viewing capabilities. Shot entirely in 4K digital, the 3D camera technology had come a long way since the Friday the 13th Part 3 in 3D entry had been released. If Valentine casting was as Y2K as you could get, this was a nice runner-up for the mid-aughts. Right off the bat, we have Tom Daddy Adkins gracing the screen as Sheriff Burke, Hunky Jensen Ackles as Tom, anymore, huh? Betsy Rue as Irene, Keir Smith as Axel, Megan Boone as Megan, and Jamie King as Sarah Palmer. I love Jamie King. Okay, she stars in one of my favorite Y2K era comedies. Does anyone else love Slackers with Jason Schwartzman and Devin Sawa? Completely underrated flick. Anyways, I think she's absolutely stunning, and she could be YouTuber Brooke Schofield's sister. I'll quickly break down the modified plot of My Bloody Valentine 3D. Once again, there's a mine owned by Tom's father, and once again, people get trapped in it because of a methane explosion. This time, they extract lone survivor Harry Warden, but instead of eating his fellow miners to stay alive, they find that he killed all of them in order to have enough oxygen for himself. The blame of this all falls on Tom's shoulders because he's the one who didn't vent the mine properly. Now Harry's been in a coma for a year since the accident happened when he wakes up in the hospital fresh as a daisy and realizes time to clock back in because he's got work to do with the first gig being stealing some hearts. The mine in the movie is still the place to party, though I view this tunnel entrance setting as a much more appealing party vibe versus the original. The year is 1997, and Tom is dating Sarah, Axel's dating Irene, and Warden is in the house looking to steal some hearts. They narrowly escape Warden's pickaxe, and Tom Daddy Atkins, as Sheriff Burke, arrives just in time to stop Warden. However, we now flash forward 10 years to find that Tom's dad, owner of Death Mine, has passed away, and Tom comes back to town for the first time since the massacre in 1997 to sell the mine and claim that sweet, sweet inheritance money. Now, Tom had skipped town immediately following the massacre, so that left Sarah to pick up the pieces by herself, and she winds up marrying Axel. Guess it's not Sarah Mercer anymore, huh? Who's also now a sheriff, but he's also a piece of shit because he has a side piece who also happens to be Sarah's employee at the grocery store she runs. You keeping up with that? I guess you just can't look like that without being a total dirtbag. He's, he's really hot. Sarah and Axel even have a son together, but this guy's ego knows no bounds. You can guess what the running conflict in the storyline is. Bodies are piling up, hearts are being broken and literally stolen, and no one is quite certain as to who's putting the mining suit back on to get revenge. But that's not to say that this movie is completely formulaic or bad in any way. In fact, to me, it's quite the opposite. The plot is super tight and slick and keeps you invested the entire runtime. 
Now, there's scene after scene of some truly ridiculous, but in the best way moments, such as the motel manager scene and the scene with Irene and the truck driver, which involves Irene doing the entire scene in subsequent chase completely naked. I obviously can't show it here because we're on YouTube, but she is an absolute dynamo running in heels, looking amazing head to toe. She seriously nailed it. And as for the trucker, he's played by Todd Farmer, who co-wrote the screenplay. Now, if you've seen previous Midnight Rental episodes, you know that I love Todd Farmer as he is the screenwriter for one of my most beloved movies of all time, Jason X. I tried to reach out to him for an interview for this very episode, but I have not yet heard back. I would die to talk to him anytime about Jason X, so fingers crossed that one day it will happen. Todd had a cameo in Jason X as well, and I love that he's included in this movie, especially since he gets a pickaxe straight to his dome. That must have been so much fun to film. Motel manager and naked Irene marathon sprinting aside, there are also some truly tense scenes as well, with my favorite being the entire scene at the grocery store where Sarah and Megan find themselves trapped inside and running for their lives. The movie looks great, and the top-notch practical effects absolutely shine in the 4K they were filmed in. Gary Tunicliffe and his team stole the show with their practical effects skills, which were in no shortage with the amount of pickaxes, through the head, and heart removals. Tunicliffe has contributed his effects magic to over a hundred different films, including several Hellraiser entries, Sleepy Hollow, Candyman, Scream 4, and so many others. While the original was filmed in Canada, the 3D reboot was filmed in surrounding areas outside of Pittsburgh. I honestly love the 3D version of My Bloody Valentine. It's not just a carbon copy of the original. And sure, it embodies similar elements and plot points, but it has a completely different pace and element. I saw it in the theaters when it was released and had a blast seeing it in 3D. But even if you watched it at home without experiencing the true 3D effects, it's still just as enjoyable in plain old 2D. The 3D wasn't just a gimmick that carries the whole movie. It's completely strong on its own. Now, of course, there's a twist at the end, just like the original had, but it's a different twist of a twist, so you might not expect it. And it was totally set up for a sequel. And I, for one, feel that we got robbed that we didn't get to see that come to fruition. While I like both of the 2000s era movies that I talked about tonight, My Bloody Valentine 3D definitely ranks higher than Valentine in my seasonal rewatchability each time that February rolls around. If you haven't seen it yet, it just might steal your heart. Happy fucking Valentine's Day. Uh, never doing that again. Never doing that again. Never doing that again. Hey, hey, Lenora, we got a customer out back. I can't help you with that right now, Carl, because they've got me slinging Girl Scout cookies down at the mall in 10 minutes. Wow. This isn't what you thought it would be. At least the males here. Oh! Oh my god. Finally, my partnership earnings paycheck. Let's see. $24? What the fuck? Problem, Lenora? <laughs> yeah, there's a problem. Why is this check so low? Well, after taxes and our standard 78%. 78%? Now, now, don't fret, Lenora. You still haven't received your incentive pay. That's where the big bucks are. Uh, okay, and when does that happen? Right after your rebrand. Look in the package that's just arrived. Hospital Massacre, also known as X-Ray, was released in 1982 by MGM and Canon Films, directed by Boaz Davidson, it's another entry in our Jilted Lovers series. Starring Playboy regular Barbie Benton, this movie is completely bonkers, quite literally from the moment that it opens, but in the best way possible. It wastes no time in setting up the story with little Harold leaving Susan a Valentine at her front door. 
Harold is played by Billy Jane, who has a long roster of movies and TV shows under his belt, including Bloody Birthday, Dr. Alien, Nightmares, Just One of the Guys, and he would later go on to portray Mikey Randell in all three seasons of Parker Lewis Can't Lose. Harold makes a key mistake here when he opts to hang around to watch her reaction. Harold, no, this is equal to reading the comments section. You are not going to like what you see. From Harold? <laughs> oh my god. Oh. <laughs> So, of course, he does what any mild-mannered child would do and eliminates one of his critics. The swift delivery of this entire scene takes place in under two and a half minutes. Both it and Harold are not fucking around. It reminds me of the opening scene of Mikey. You don't love me anymore. That's not a toy. I know that. Mikey, no! We flash forward to the extremely specific number of 19 years later, where we find Susan, played by the picture-perfect Barbie Benton. I mean, just look at her hair. It's stunning. Having a tense conversation with her ex-husband and daughter as she prepares to pick up some test results from the hospital. No, I can't. I've got to go to the hospital and get my test results. I'll see you at your place at 5 o'clock. This Mr. Wright. Knock it off, Tom. What an asshole. Who? My ex-husband. She says the famous last words. This isn't going to take long, is it? No, it'll just take a couple minutes. Be right back. No, you won't. Hey, wait. Isn't this the hospital where they had all that trouble last year? What trouble? Some patient ran amok or something. Oh, oh please. I'll see you in a minute. Oh, boy. Now, what are the chances that that's Harold? Probably pretty darn good. Once inside the hospital, Susan is met with just about every obtuse and clueless staff member and patient that the building holds. This is the most incompetently ran hospital ever. Not only can she not find anyone to actually help or guide her the correct way to go, there are mental ward patients also just roaming the place like free-range chickens. There's this guy and that guy and those guys. You shouldn't be up here, lady. We're fumigating this floor. But the receptionist downstairs said the eighth floor. This is the ninth floor. You better get out of here, kiddo. Who I am 99% convinced are dressed like that as an homage to My Bloody Valentine, which was released the year prior, but I truly have no confirmation of that and it very well just might be wishful thinking on my end. Every single male contained within the hospital, whether they are on staff or a patient, cannot stop leering at Susan to the point where it's comical, but it's also to intentionally keep you guessing on who the killer might be. This is one of my favorite scenes. Look out! It's Dustin Diamond, the later years. Why aren't you answering it? It might be somebody I don't want to speak to. Maybe it's Mother. Do you want to talk to her? Not particularly. Please talk to her. Probably isn't her. Please. Hello? Dr. Davidson. Dr. Davidson, report to emergency immediately. Dr. Davidson, report to emergency immediately. Now, while Susan is there to simply get some test results, we see that the killer swaps her results for another patient's concerning x-ray, so that when she finally does make contact with a doctor who can assist her, he takes one look at her x-ray, oh my god, how did you get that dollar store Hawaiian lace so far up your colon, and forbids her from leaving. But not before he insists that she gets fully naked for a full body exam for some reason. A simple formality. I've been promoted and I just need some sort of medical certificate for my new insurance. No checkup is ever just a simple formality, Miss Jeremy. Dora, Kitty, you may go. Yes, Dr. Yes, Saxon. Now, get undressed. What x-ray result would require a full body exam completely naked? I thought x-rays showed internal problems. What kind of hospital is this? I don't know. It was the 80s. 
Now, thankfully, she's expertly backlit while she gets undressed, and while she previously couldn't find a single doctor in the entire hospital to help her, the moment she starts to take her clothes off, they're all piling in the room. Oh, hey Bill, I thought I heard the sound of a woman getting undressed. None of it makes sense. And to make matters worse, she just listens to him when he says she can't leave. After being there for what has to have been several hours at this point, we have no idea what time it is on the inside. It's like Vegas, there's no windows. I would have just left. No matter how many doctors or times she asks what's wrong, they insist on keeping her in the dark about her perceived condition while simultaneously holding her hostage because apparently it's that immediate of a threat to the point where if she were to step outside, she would explode. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to keep you here for a while. Why? Some discrepancies in the tests. But... We'll have to keep you under observation for a few days. Is it serious? No. It's nothing. You can tell me the truth. Is it serious? Yeah. It might be. But even though it's so ridiculous, there are still so many things I like about this movie, and it's not just limited to the nostalgic ability to smoke in hospitals. Ah, simpler times. It's just that everyone's go-to Valentine's Day slasher is My Bloody Valentine. And don't get me wrong, My Bloody Valentine is a great movie and I love it too. But X-Ray, Hospital Massacre, whatever you want to call it, I feel often gets overlooked and doesn't get as much love in the Valentine's Day slasher category as it deserves. And there's just something endearing about this movie. I can't explain it. The direction Boas Davidson takes this in is just fascinating. And sure, it's a slasher, but in my eyes, it also has a slight jalo feel, with the long meandering shots, stark contrasted lighting, and extremely dramatic music. It's Dr. Jacobs! Someone's killed her! She's inside! Which was composed and conducted by Arlen Ober, who is no stranger to horror films. He is also credited as an orchestrator or additional composer on films such as Child's Play, House 1 and 2, Bloody Birthday, an episode of Tales from the Crypt, and one of my all-time favorites, the Don Dohler classic, Night Beast. Stay tuned for Night Beast love on an upcoming episode. But back to the beat of Jallo films and how much this movie in particular feels like a diet Jallo flick. During a recent rewatch, I even queued up one of my favorite music scores by Ennio Morricone, Sensulita, and it fits X-Ray perfectly. Just look at this. with the score, all you'd have to do is poorly overdub this and it would be right up there with a Dario Argento film. There are some scenes that also echo the same emptiness that Halloween 2's hospital setting invokes. We can credit a lot of the film's look and feel to the fact that director of photography was Nicholas Josef von Sternberg, who has worked as DOP and cinematographer on a number of required viewing films, such as Slaughterhouse Rock, Dr. Alien, Dolomite, and Tourist Trap. While on the subject of sensuality and adult content, there's also the continued buildup to Barbie Benton having to get naked for an exam, which for no reason at all includes a foot rub. What the hell? This would never happen today. They make use of every naked minute that they can with Barbie on the exam table with shots that are so unnecessary long, it makes it supremely uncomfortable, but that just adds to the tenseness of the situation as a whole while you're still trying to figure out who's the killer. Is he a killer or just a creepy doctor? That could have been the third title for this movie. Now, let's keep in mind that she was just going to be a couple minutes because she had test results to pick up, but I think at this point, if I were her boyfriend, I would have at least gone in to see where she was. It has been hours. Though, look at him, we don't know how many road pops he had on the way to get there, he's all tuckered out. From the jump, Susan is in constant danger, and they manage to keep that sense of urgency surrounding her, especially when she's naked. In my opinion, they do an excellent job of not directly revealing who the killer is by casting suspicion over everyone. Though, on the second rewatch, it's extremely obvious, but then again, hindsight is 2020. 
The special effects were done by Joe Quinn Livin, who has worked special effects on an immense amount of films, including Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, Schizoid, which incidentally was released on DVD as a 2-4 package deal with X-Ray, Face Off, Without Warning, and so many more. There is plenty of blood to be had in X-Ray, along with some fantastic makeup effects. The setup of this scene in particular reminds me of the legendary dry ice scene in Jason X. However, the aftermath is quite a bit different. What are we looking at here? Macaulay Culkin's allergic bee sting reaction at the end of My Girl? There's also this unexplained gang of old women who keep popping up, one of which is always playing the spoons, and another is this guy just dressed as a woman. It's never addressed, and I was certain that it had to have been the director making a tongue-in-cheek cameo, but when I looked at the credits, he's simply listed as Jonathan Moore, and I can't find out any more information about him. That's not Dr. Jacobs. Why, no, it's a fine young man. Where is Dr. Jacobs? Susan's quick trip to the hospital turns into a long nightmare for her and everyone else who was cursed to work that shift, all because 19 years prior, she had the audacity as a seven-year-old to reject Harold's Valentine. Dude, get over it. Just get over it. Go out with somebody else. Get over it. Go out with somebody else. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Also, real quick, I want to point out that young Susan is played by Elizabeth Hoy, who also stars in Bloody Birthday. Bloody Birthday is like the uncredited glue tying this entire movie together. <laughs> Now, for once, I won't spoil the ending for you, but rest assured, the entire movie is absolutely worth seeing. X-Ray, Hospital Massacre, Is It a Killer or Just a Creepy Doctor, whatever you want to call this movie, I absolutely love it. I will always champion it, and I hope that you enjoy it too. They say she's terribly sick. But she's so young and lovely. Young and lovely on the outside, maybe. Old and rotten on the inside. I used to think that having a bran muffin and coffee for breakfast was a great way to lose weight. Boy, was I wrong. Just one incredibly delicious ultra slim fast fruit juice shake has less than half the calories and 75% less fat. In fact, it would be hard to find a breakfast this low in fat and calories and as high in this many of the nutrients doctors recommend. So a slim fast shake is a lot more than a great way to lose weight. It's a healthy way to start the day. Tonight on News Channel 5 at 11, one out of six children have it. Is Ritalin the only answer? Not anymore. Well, it's not working. It's just not working. Parents are putting away the bottle and turning on to mind games. Tonight, a five on your side investigation that'll change the way you think. They our team. One taking care of the other. Tonight, News Channel 5's Ted Henry with a special Valentine's Day surprise. Sure to touch the heart on News Channel 5 at 11. Bernard? What the hell is this? This is the rebrand I was talking about. We're following the money. And where the money currently is, is in adult content. Adult content? I thought you guys were... A family-friendly company. We are, and families get divorced all of the time. We're tapping into the single dad market. Big bucks there. Uh, I mean, okay, but does the single dad market really require that I be pantsless? And also, why doesn't this say Midnight Rental? Oh, we're changing the name of your store. Bye-bye, Midnight Rental. Hello, BoobTube Video. What? Absolutely not. This is where I draw the line. You can throw me in a sash. You can make me wear an apron. You can force me to deliver and eat dozens of pizzas. But I refuse to sell my show name. Not even for all the Girl Scout cookies in the world? No. Nice try, though. I have to maintain my integrity. Consider this partnership severed. This was just a trial contract anyways. I read the fine print. Well, some are cut out for the shill life. It was nice working with you, Lenora. You know where to find me if you change your mind. <laughs> Oh, 
Now, even though at times it may feel as though X-Way was written specifically for Barbie Benton to be naked in, she was well within her comfort zone to be without clothes as she was a Playboy magazine regular. Born Barbara Klein on January 28, 1950, she began modeling at age 16. After turning 18, she appeared as an extra on the late night show Playboy After Dark and co-hosted two episodes before Hugh Hefner himself asked her out on a date. This led to a five-year relationship with the magazine Magnet, along with four cover appearances. It was Hugh who would convince her to alter her name to Barbie Benton, cementing her as a household name. Benton was more than just a pretty face. She was also a gifted singer and songwriter and would go on to release eight albums. She outgrew brass buckles on her shoes By twelve she was filling out her jeans With a mind young and wild And a body that the devil styled She couldn't make a man do anything Barbie Benton! She became a regular on the Love Boat and Hee Haw and also studied with the Groundlings. She also starred in an extremely short-lived TV show called Sugar Time, which ran at the height of Jiggle TV and has one of the most grating theme songs I've ever heard. Some are cute and some are curvy, some are shy and some are nervy, some are mean and some are grouchy, but they smile and dance. Girls, 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 don't you want to... Despite starring in X-Ray, she said in a 1985 Playboy interview, I don't want to be the queen of the B-movies, and I'm turning down the roles that are being offered to me in that area because they're not movies that I can take my parents to. I've done a few of them, and they're just not quality films. Now, I'm going to plug my ears and pretend that I didn't hear that because I would argue that X-Ray is just fine the way it is. After marrying real estate developer George Gradow and having two children, she stepped away from acting. While it was Hefner who would take credit for her stage name, it was Benton herself who discovered and persuaded him to buy the iconic Playboy Mansion, insisting it was the perfect property. She clearly has an eye for home buying and real estate, especially once you take in her stunning one-of-a-kind Aspen home, the Copper Palace, which was designed by architect Bart Price. We honestly don't care if anyone would like it or not. We built it for ourselves, Barbie said. But it's elegant. I've never heard anyone say that they don't like it, though a lot of people say that they couldn't live in it. I love it. Well, that was interesting. Sponsorships are not what they're cracked up to be, especially if you have to give away all your freedoms. But at least I tried. Trying is just the first step towards failure. That's right, Carl. And it's just further proof that I don't need to be on any apps of any kind. Did you hear that, Carmine? <sighs> Carmine, did you forget to take my profile down? I wanted to see what was out there for you. I made a new one on Latch. Oh, dear God. When's the next episode? And what are your top five ways to unwind? Do you prefer dogs or cats? <sighs> We're closed! What are some of your pet peeves? Sorry, Lenora. If we learned anything from these movies tonight, you better let them down gently. Final question. What are you wearing? Ooh, I'm getting a vision. He's lonely. Well, if he's looking to buy love, he can purchase it somewhere else because I'm no longer for sale. Ha, that's right, Lenora. You've still got it. Oh my God. Are those cameras still on? Dr. Arthur S. Aronson, providing pain relief through laser surgery. Laser surgery can provide pain relief from ingrown toenails, warts, and fungal nails. Hi, I'm Dr. Arthur Aronson. This modern laser technology may work for you. 
Give my office a call at 376-4040. Relief may be only a phone call away. Call Dr. Aronson today at 376-4040. The office is conveniently located one quarter mile east of Akron City Hospital. Turn following these messages. Monday on Fresh Prince, the butler has a sex change operation. Just kidding. She's his birthday date. Get ready to have your candles blown out. Wait till you see what she's giving him. Oh, shut up! Then on Ferris Bueller, Jeannie falls hard for the new boy in school. A whole load of fun on NBC Monday. Hey, Lenora! What are you gonna do for money in the meantime? Well, in the meantime, I gotta go clock in for my shift at Bucky's. Those restrooms aren't gonna clean themselves. Emmy, that's a great backpack. Where'd you get it? Thanks, I got sponsored by Adidas. Emmy's Horoscope Corner. That's one H, three R's, and two O's. What the f I'll tell you what, we had a pretty good time considering we're all going to die, huh? <laughs> Actually, I think that's a good way to look at it. There's yeah, nothing wrong sure. with looking at it that's like right. that. Seriously. Listen, hey. Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog. Okay. Hey, hey, come here. <laughs> a little closer. I got something to tell you. Hey, Laura, hey, thanks. A little closer. Oh, that's great. Hey, <laughs> Lenora's not going to tell you, but we're on Patreon now. Sign up. Be a subscriber to the best horror show on YouTube. Look into my ping pong ball eyes and tell me you don't want to join Patreon. Ah, Patreon. Ah. <laughs> Sorry, I had too many cigarettes. <laughs> Sorry, Lenora. <laughs>